Um, all right, let's go into our message this morning, the four faces of Advent. And I am very excited about who we are looking at this morning. Uh, I, I can't believe I'm actually going to say this, but the person we're looking at this morning is kind of controversial. This is a controversial character in the church, and I don't think it should be. The person we are going to be looking at this morning is, of course, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And we cannot talk about Advent. We cannot talk about the people that were included in the journey of Christ's arrival without bringing Mary into the conversation. She is absolutely pivotal. Now, why is Mary so controversial? Well, in certain denominations, Mary has been put on a platform to an almost godlike status where it gets a little bit confusing. Because of that, I think a lot of other denominations have gone, we don't want to talk about her at all because we're afraid uh, we might say the wrong thing. So this morning, I want to not go all the way that way or all the way that way, but I simply want to read the text and tell you that we are dealing with an extraordinary human being that it was used by God in an extraordinary way. And uh, man, there's so much we can learn from Mary's life and that's really what I want to do today as we dive into it. I want to, I'm not going to make a promise. That's, that's not a good thing. Um, I'm going to tell you, or I'm going to attempt to tell you from Mary's story, where we get favor, blessings, and joy. That's a good sermon right there. If I can deliver on 30% of that, that's a good return for you this morning. But let's dive into it. Luke 1, verses 26 to 33. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, his kingdom will never end. And we are going to read through the whole account this morning, but I want to stop right there because already in the little bit we have here, there's a whole bunch of interesting things going on. I want to focus on this statement that the angel Gabriel makes right in the beginning when he sees Mary. He kicks it off and he says, greetings, you are highly favored. And uh, what makes this statement kind of strange is that if you remove the church goggles, if you remove the Christian goggles, if you remove the, uh, the ability we have to look back at a story, if we step into the story and look at it for just what it is, nothing about Mary's situation feels like a favored situation. Um, the angel of the Lord is about to tell Mary that she is now officially an unwed pregnant teenager right? That's not a favorable position to be in, but it gets even better and it gets even more exciting. Here it is. Mary, not only are you pregnant, but you're going to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So that's going to be super easy to explain to everybody. Mary, it gets even better. Your to-be husband, Joseph, has no idea what's going on at this point. So that's even more exciting. Mary, it gets even better. You are living in a culture where you literally can be stoned to death for, having, for committing a sexual sin of this nature. So Mary, you're highly favored, but your relationship potentially is going to fall apart. You potentially might lose your life. But Mary, don't worry because you're living in a patriarchal society where your word means nothing. So you're good. 
But if, if I just want to continue giving you good news, Mary. Um, you also come from Nazareth, which everybody sees as the worst town around. And Mary, just to cap it all off, I just want to be the angel of good news. You are a Jew living in a Roman-occupied place. So again, you're basically seen as nothing. So Mary, good news. Your life is falling apart, but you are highly favored. How on earth does this even make any kind of sense, right? And I think this is the way we look at favor. I think when we think about our lives and when we think about what favor is, we directly view favor as what is happening in our lives, what is actually going on. That is why we've even built it into our greeting. When I meet you or when I see you, the first thing I say to you is, how are you? And I'm asking you how you are, because based upon how you are, in other words, based upon everything going on in your life, that should determine whether you're in a good place or whether you are in a bad place. But that's not, this morning, how the angel of the Lord views it. He says to Mary this morning that you have favor on your life. And what I love is, is he actually tells us why. If you read the full sentence, it says this, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Where does favor come from? Favor is found in the presence of the Lord. Favor is not found in how we are doing. Favor is not found in our outward circumstances. Favor is not found in what we have and in what we don't have. Favor is not found in how are you, but rather favor is found in who are you with. That would be a more spiritual question really to ask when we bump into each other. It's not so much how are you, but who is it that you are with? When I thought about this this morning and when I thought about how I could sort of illustrate the point I look no further than the great, the great and the mighty remora fish. Steve, if you'll put it up. There it is. This fish you have never heard of because it's not great and it's not mighty at all. The remora fish is actually a really weird fish. It has this weird thing on the top of its head. Um, that thing on the top of its head prevents it from swimming really well. So the remora fish struggles to actually get food. The remora fish struggles to defend itself. The remora fish, in every sense of the word, really has every disadvantage you could ever want being in the sea. So if we ever had to ask the remora fish, how are you doing? Are you favored? The answer would be, I am five seconds away from death at all times. <laughs> but here it is this morning. The remora fish has learned the critical key that it's not about who, how are you doing, but it's about who are you with. Steve, let's go to the next one. So, so the remora fish is often, uh, it's often called a sucker or a suck up. Nobody wants to be called a sucker or a suck up. But here's the thing. That weird thing on the top of its head that prevents it from swimming as fast as the other fish actually puts it in a position where it can attach itself to a host. The remora fish has learned that it's not about how you are, but it's about who you are with. So most often, when you are looking for the remora fish, you will find it attached to the apex predator of the jungle, the great white shark. So now this fish that can't normally swim very quick is traveling the oceans of the planet at the speed of a great white shark. Now this fish that normally struggles to find a place to be safe and to secure itself is the most secure fish on earth. You know why? Because no one wants to tangle with jaws. Are you with me? It gets even better. 
the remora fish now lives in an open buffet, ladies and gentlemen. If it's not feasting on the parasites of the great white shark, it's literally eating the chunks of a whale coming out of the shark's mouth that goes to the bottom, and the remora fish just nibbles off of it. The remora fish, ladies and gentlemen, is probably the most disadvantaged fish in all of the ocean, but at the same time is probably the most favored fish in all of the ocean, not because of what it can do, but because of who it is attached to. So I say to you this morning, <laughs> I say to you this morning, dear church, in Matthew, Jesus says, keep your eyes on the sparrow. But I say in the book of Mark, look to the remora fish. <laughs> it's all about timing. Um, <laughs> all jokes aside, and really all jokes aside this morning, I was, I was thinking about this a lot in the week. There's really actually one question that matters at all times. And that question is, is God with you? Is God with you? Do you have God with you? And I know it's a stressful time, and I know we're all sort of panicked and anxious, and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on, and there's always a whole bunch of stuff going on. And we're looking at our situations, and we're trying to figure things out all the time, and we're always in a place of deficit. We always don't have enough time. We always don't have enough money. We always don't have enough bandwidth. We always, always, always... And I think we get so caught up in those things. But the question really should not always be based upon those things. But at some point, we've got to go, who am I actually with? The Bible says that if God is for you, then who or what can possibly be against you? I, uh, I want to show you something from Genesis. And this just for me, we're going to look at a couple of portions of Scripture from Genesis. But th this just for me summarizes and shows how incredible Mary is. But look at this, Genesis 15, verses 1 to 3. And uh, at this moment in time, God is essentially meeting with Abraham. He's speaking to Abraham. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. And God says this, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. I am your very great reward. You see, the greatest favor you can have in this life is God himself. There is nothing greater than that. But look at what Abraham does. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? I mean, <laughs> God of the universe says, Abraham, I have made myself known to you. I am giving myself to you as a reward. And Abraham's response is, yeah, but what can you really give me? <laughs> right? Thank God for God's mercy and God's grace. Amen. Amen. Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inheritly, inherit my estate at Elzer of Damascus? And Abraham said, You have given me no and Abraham said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. And we know what God goes on to do. God goes on to do a miraculous work in Abraham's life. But I really feel that Abraham misses it in this moment. What God is saying to Abraham is, listen, I am your reward. I am your favor. If you have me in your life, everything else will take care of itself. And even as God is personally telling Abraham that Abraham is like, but, but I've got problems. You see, I'm thinking about my future. I'm thinking about who's going to lead my household. Yes, God, I understand that spiritually you are mine, but I've got practical issues that I'm dealing with. And I want to tell you this morning that spiritually, practically, emotionally, and in every other way, if God is for you, if God is with you, you carry favor in your life because favor comes from the presence of the Lord. So let's carry on this morning. Let's look at this. Luke 1, verses 34 to 45. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. 
Listen to that. No word from God will ever fail. Mary responds to this, and she says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Listen to this. Blessed is, is she who has believed the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And that's really the... Oh, good, it's on my phone. I thought it was my... Sometimes I just think I hear voices and phones. <laughs> but I want to focus on this verse right here. Luke 1, verses 45. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. It is absolutely astonishing for me how here is young Mary, and she gets this unbelievable word from the Lord, and she is so quick to not only believe the word that the Lord is giving her, but she is quick to receive it and she is quick to be obedient to it. Again, I want to go back to Genesis 18, verses 10 to 15, and I want to contrast this with another moment, again involving Abraham. But look at this. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, like Jacob. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. <laughs> I love this. And then the Lord said, no, but you did. <laughs> so you have no faith, and you're a liar. <laughs> So where do we find blessings? Blessings is found in believing God's promises. Blessings are found in believing God's promises. You know, and it's so easy for us to read this portion of Scripture, and God comes and He says to Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a child. And it's easy for us now to read it and to go, oh, Sarah, whatever, man. Why don't you have faith? I hear you. But weren't you super stressed out just three days ago because you weren't sure how you were going to pay the next rent? You see, it's not any different to what Sarah goes through in this moment. Sarah laughs because she doesn't believe ultimately that what God is saying to her is actually possible. And we do the same thing. We might not always be laughing, but every time we're fearful, every time we're anxious, every time we are stressed out about the practical things of life, if you really think about it, what you're actually saying is, is God, I don't know if you're big enough to handle this. I'm not sure if it's actually within your ability to take care of me when it comes to this. And I love how Mary gets given this news and immediately Mary says, not only do I believe, but Mary then shifts into saying, I am your servant. I am available. I am obedient. I will do whatever it is that you need me to do. I, uh, I was thinking about this in the week and one of the things that I was thinking about was just this idea of faith. And why is it that God is so passionate about faith? Why is it that faith is the currency of Christianity? Why is that? I mean, and I started thinking about what would it be like if I were God, if I were God of the universe? What is it that I would want from people? What would I want from my people? And immediately when you think about human beings, you know, Christmas is coming up. 
We think about material things. We think about if I love you, if I honor you, I give you a material thing to say thank you to you. But how do you do that with God? How do you give God a material thing? So money and material things mean nothing to him in that sense. So when we think about what would please God, what would bring God pleasure, we come all the way to, as I thought about it, well, I think what would please God, what would give God pleasure, what would please him is if my people actually obeyed me and if my people actually listened to the words that I spoke to them. I think if I were the God of the universe, that is what would give me pleasure, is if my people listened to me and if they actually obeyed me. And I believe that that is what gives God pleasure too. But as I thought about it, I thought to myself, well, there's two places where obedience comes from, if you really think about it. Where does obedience come from? And I believe there's two places. The first place obedience comes from is the fear of the consequences of disobedience. (laughs) So that's the first place obedience comes from. You are being obedient to someone, whether it be a mom, whether it be dad, whether it be a school principal, whoever it is, you're being obedient to them simply because you are afraid of the consequences of if you are disobedient. And I will say this morning that if you think about it, some obedience is probably better than no obedience at all. So I think that's fine. But I don't think that the fear of punishment is ever going to be enough to really create a consistent relationship between you and the Lord. So I believe this morning there is a second place where obedience comes from. And the second place where obedience comes from is it comes from a place of knowing who the person is and knowing what their intentions towards you are. It's a whole different place. And uh, I'll I'll sort of illustrate it to you this way. I, uh, I am the father of three daughters, and I know many of you have had the honor and the privilege of raising kids, and it's a struggle at times, and you want them to listen, but you want them to listen in the right way, and many, many years ago, I had to ask myself the question, what kind of a parent do I want to be? What kind of a dad do I want to be? And I essentially landed on two things. I believe that the kind of father I want to be is, first of all, the kind of man that leads by example. And when I say leads by example, I'm not saying that I'm a perfect human being. If you spend three minutes with me, that goes out the window and you realize it quickly. (laughs) But when I say that I want to be a good father, it means that I want to live my life taking responsibility. I want to live my life taking ownership. I want to live my life in integrity and authenticity. I want to live my life the best way I know how with the most amount of wisdom I know how. I want to be an example in what I do and in who I am. So that's the first thing. So when it comes to fathering my kids, it actually has less to do with what they are doing, and it's actually got more to do with what I am doing. How am I carrying myself? How am I behaving? Are they seeing an example in me? So that's number one. Number two, I want my kids to know that there is no one else on this planet I love more than them. I will lay my life down for them. I will take a bullet for them. I will do whatever I need to do because of my endless love for them. So if you take those two things, if you take the concept of this person is a well-rounded person that uses wisdom in their life, and you then take their intentions for me is nothing but pure, you then find yourself in a situation where if I go to one of my kids and I say, hey, I don't know that you should go to that party on Friday night, This is what they're hearing. They're hearing a sensible person that's lived their life with wisdom, that's lived their life in a good way, that loves me more than anything else on this planet, does not think it's a good idea for me to go to this party. You know what? I believe and I trust in the person that they are, and I believe and I trust in the intentions they have for me. Therefore, I am now freed up to make the decision on my own not to go to that party, not because I'm afraid I'll be called out, but because I love and I trust where it's coming from. You see, there's two ways for obedience to happen. The one is through fear, and the other one is through faith. And I really believe that that is what we see in God, is we see God saying, I am perfect, I am holy, 
I am almighty. I am all-knowing. There's nothing I don't know. There's nothing I can't do. I love you. That is my character. That is who I am. And then when you look at my son, Jesus, who died on the cross for you, you now know my intentions for you. You know that I know everything, and you know that I love you more than anything. So when I ask you to do something, or when I tell you I'm going to do something, you can trust me and you can believe in me based upon who I am and based upon my intentions towards you. And I really believe with all of my heart that when you start living your life that way, there is a blessing that will start to take place in your life. When I look at it like that, it makes sense that what God is looking for is a relationship defined by faith in who God is and in what his intentions are towards us. When we live out our lives, submitting our ways to the Lord through faith, because we know him and we've exper- we will experience a blessed life. So I love that this morning. Mary experiences a blessing because she has faith in the promises of God. She believes him and that leads her to obedience. I wanna, I wanna come to the last piece of our story And we've heard what Gabriel's had to say. We've heard what Elizabeth has had to say. But let's look at what Mary says. Luke 1, verses 46 to 57. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful for the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful." to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. So I love this this morning, and there's a line that Mary says here that just caught my heart as I was reading it. Where is joy found? Joy is found in God's mindfulness and mercy towards you. Joy is found in God's mindfulness and God's mercy towards you. We're uh, steadily, obviously, approaching Christmas, and we're all starting to think through, what do we want for Christmas? We have started a family group text. We've actually had one for a long time, and I've started putting in gifts that I want this year for Christmas. And uh, nobody really is responding to any of my text messages, And the more they don't respond to my text message, the more I'm upping the ante. So I believe the last thing I put on there was a Rolex watch for (laughs) $42,000. I think Victoria responded with that emoji of the face with the two laughing tears. So I have a strong feeling that I might not get anything for Christmas this year in spite of all of my efforts. But the reality is, the truth is, is that yes, we talk about things that we want for Christmas... But if I had to ask you, what do you really want for Christmas? I'm willing to say that a lot of people in this place will say, I want happiness. I just want to be happy. Just five minutes of happiness. Please, can you give me something to be happy about? Something to be joyful about? I think if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us are running around desperately trying to be happy. And we're doing everything we can to do it. We will go into crippling debt for one happy night at the mall on a Friday night, right? Because we just want one moment of happiness. We will break promises we've made to ourselves for just one sip or just one bite because we're so desperately looking just for a feeling of happiness. We will fight with everyone in our family, making sure that we all know exactly what the plan is for the happiness we're going to experience for two hours on Christmas morning. We will fight and be sad and be miserable and depressed for happiness. And the truth is this morning, a lot of us will do whatever it takes to be happy. The truth is, if you really have to look at your life, a lot of us are doing whatever we can to find happiness. Mary says, 
that her soul glorifies and her spirit rejoices. Man, there is something deep about that. There is something real about that. There is something authentic about that. Happiness is this fleeting thing that comes one moment and is gone the next. We do everything we can, but it's here and then it's gone. Mary is not trying to find happiness through all her external efforts. Mary is experiencing internal joy through God's redeeming works towards her. The more Mary ponders on God's grace, God's goodness, and God's mindfulness towards her, the more Mary experiences a real joy on the inside. I remember years ago hearing a man say that the world is not looking for happiness. What the world is looking for is forgiveness. We are looking for forgiveness. We want to know that we belong. We want to know that we are loved. We want to know that we've been set free. And the truth this morning is, is that a lot of us are sitting in this place and we are not feeling a sense of joy. I want to say to you today that if you feel miserable, if you feel low, if you feel down, I believe it's possibly because of one or two things. Either you have not experienced the grace and the mercy and forgiveness of God in your life, or you are no longer mindful of the goodness, the grace, and the mercy of God in your life. Because when your life is lived from that foundation, where you understand you have been forgiven, you understand His mercy, you understand His love, you understand the good works He's done towards you, what will start to happen is, is you will start to live a life filled with joy as opposed to always feeling unhappy about the things that are not happening on the outside. So I want to close today by praying for you. I'm going to ask you to pray to stand in this place with me. Favor is found in the presence of the Lord. Blessings are found in trusting and believing God's promises for you. But here it is. Here's the foundation of all of it. Joy is found in God's mindfulness and God's mercy. So Father, this morning, I want to thank you for who you are in our midst, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord, this morning that you have made yourself available to us. We can experience you. We can have a relationship with you. I thank you, Lord, for your promises you have made us. We can hang on to those promises. I thank you, Lord, this morning. It's not about what we have or what we are experiencing, but it's about who we are with. And I thank you that you are the one that we are with. So, Father, this morning, I want to pray for, firstly, Lord, anybody in this place that has just lost sight of your mercy and your goodness and your forgiveness. I pray, Lord, that you will remind them this morning of who you are. You will remind them of the goodness that you've given them in their lives. Father, the next group of people I want to pray for this morning is the group that says, I don't know Jesus. I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I've never really experienced the grace of Jesus. If you're in this place today, or maybe you're looking online, I don't believe that this is a coincidence. I don't believe that this is an accident. I believe that God has preordained this before the foundations of the world, that you would be in this moment hearing these words so that you would understand that there is a God, He is real, and He loves you, and He wants to rescue you, and He wants to redeem you. So this morning, if you're sad and you're miserable, and you've been running around like crazy, trying to get happiness everywhere, but you failed, maybe, just maybe, what you are in desperate need of is the grace of God Almighty in your life. So if that's you this morning, I want to pray for you. Father, I want to thank you for all those in the room that don't know you, all those watching online that have never experienced you. Father, I thank you this morning that somehow through this message and through this experience, they have come to the realization that they are lost, they are dead without you. Father, they are dead in their trespasses and in their sins. I thank you, Lord, this morning that they have a revelation of the fact that you are God the Son. I thank you, Lord, that they have a revelation of the fact that you died on the cross for us and you rose again. I thank you, Lord, this morning that we can come to you and we can repent of our sins and we can believe in your promise, which is your son, Jesus. So, Father, I thank you for new life. I thank you for transformation. I thank you, Lord, for every person in this place that you are faithful to complete the work that you have started on the inside of them. We love you, Father. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everybody said...
Thank you so much for joining us.